by Ito Stern and Esther Wesley. Esther is running one course uh, this year uh, as part of the program. Unfortunately, Ito will not travel in the last uh, minute to the competition, so I mean, it's a difficult time for, for everyone. Uh, I'm very happy that she could join us uh, virtually online uh, tonight. And this is the first uh, online presentation. We will have several during the public program. Uh, I'll just read something briefly uh, from her last uh, experience in biography, uh, and then I'll leave the floor to, to her. So, uh, Ito's prolific filmmaking and writing occupies a highly discursive position between the fields of art, philosophy, and politics, constituting a deep exploration of late capitalism's social, cultural, and financing imaginaries. Her films and lectures have increasingly addressed the presentational context of art, while her writing has circulated widely uh, through publication in both academic and art journals, often online. She studied documentary film directing at the uh, Japan Institute of the Moving Image and at the HFF University of Television and Film and Media. She subsequently studied philosophy at the Academy of Arts in Vienna, where she is a doctor. She is professor for experimental film and video at the UDK, University of the Arts Berlin, where she founded the Research Center for Proxy Politics together with Vera Tolman and Ross Lepay. If you have more on her biography, uh, the space, uh, as we will have uh, uh, a film and video uh, that we will see tonight, I'll not take that much time. Uh, I give the floor to Hito. Uh, thank you again for being with us uh, tonight. Uh, looking forward to this experience. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for having me. <laughs> My speech will be a bit strange because I'm having this massive feedback. Um, but, but I will do my best to give a short introduction to the um, work I want to show you. I'm aware it will be very hot and also I read that you have a super interesting program with many very very interesting strands I'm very sad not to be able to follow them so I picked a, a collaborative work actually it's not my work it's a collaborative work I made with my colleagues Gago Gago Shitze and Milos Trakilovic um, one and a half years ago more or less exactly before Corona struck. And this is a lecture and what I will show you is a recording uh, inside the installation. It's being usually screened in and this will play locally. So I'm not going to share my screen. I hope the quality improves a little. Let me just um, tell you a few things about this lecture. We made it for the occasion of the 30th anniversary of the coming down of the Berlin Wall um, in 2019, of course, but seen through the lens of the production of fashion label Balenciaga. And along with it, we are talking about a lot of different things. I think mainly the production of identity as commodity through social media and uh, digital platforms and how, in our view, they are tied to the production of identity, body, body image, um, but also to processes of geopolitics and privatization. Um, among very other things. I hope, I hope this is a fairly entertaining work. <laughs> so you still have focus to, for uh, Esther's lecture afterwards, which surely will be super interesting. So please see this more as the entertainment section. 
Maybe we can just press play now. Thirty years ago, the Berlin Wall came down. Or did it? There's a quasi-mathematic rhythm I recently stumbled upon. You have 100 meters worth of raw material. Now, how do you fence in the largest surface area? This is the great time I show you. It's an expression of post-Soviet Georgia. Misha is not on the wall, but on the roof. He's soon to become stateless, and riot police will arrest Misha has been up the roof for six hours now. That he is threatening to jump down. But the most important question is, what is he wearing? We don't see his shoes, so we don't know if he's wearing those. Why would Misha be wearing a bunch of for this mission? Well, we will never know, but probably it's a good choice. There is a tiny West wearing something similar. How did Misha get up that roof? Well, to clear things up, we need to start from the beginning. This wind unleashed the chain reaction of conflict throughout the former East after 89 and the fall of Berlin Wall. A couple years later, this is what the change in the The story of present day Balenciaga starts in Georgia. Even behind those people is maybe a boy called Dan Abbasalia. He must be around 10 years old. He's fleeing war, one of the countless post-revolutionary wars of the former East. He will later on reach success as a fashion designer with his label Betmont, after which he will become head designer of Balenciaga in 2015, revolutionizing fashion and propelling the brands to the very top. A lot of other things happen in between, among them, of course, the invention of the internet. And the next thing we know, we come to this. Here is Kim Kardashian wearing that long and Trump's white clothes. How come? This guy has a theory. This is Christopher Wiley, a whistleblower who reported on the electoral manipulation by Cambridge Analytica. He said, Fashion data was used to create AI models to help Steve Bannon build his alt-right from no backups for we 1,010 days. We used weaponized cultural narratives to undermine the perception of reality. And fashion played a big part in that. And he flooded with ideas no one had ever been taught. And it was in that moment that he was sold. But I didn't know in that moment, sitting in that hotel room, that we were about to destroy the world again. And it was in that moment that I became Icarus, and I put on black screen, and I flew into the sun. And I dragged millions of people with me. And it was from this conversation, this folly, that the world then burned. But instead, as the 2019 screen collection was dubbed, the right in the lines, taken from John Rathman's screen paint on the runway. The show also featured an autonomous track by Boyfriend. The title of the track is inspired by the theme song of a game called Mr. Bones Wild Ride. Mr. Bones Wild Ride is a video game named after a really slow 
roller coaster ride, but with a twist. He had a lifetime of 70 real minutes, around four years in game time. In addition, there were those props of the skeleton holding off his top hat scattered around here and there as if to mock the customers. Once the ride came to an end, the passengers found themselves on a long pass that took about two hours to traverse. Once they reached the end, they faced the sign of dress. The path led straight back to the end of the ride. They were on a loop. The ride did not have an end. I can recall my father telling me about the fashion show he once organized. He worked as a journalist during the Bosnian War, and together with a handful of friends, he organized a fashion show somewhere in July of 1994 in the central hotel of Tuzla, the city in which I was born. Now, the mission behind their fashion operation was to make themselves somehow visible to the rest of the world at the wake of war. And to them, fashion seemed like the obvious means to achieve that. I tried to backtrack some evidence of this event by approaching local television archives and reaching out to people who somehow have been part of it. And the ones that I spoke to could all recall the events taking place, but images of it had all somehow vanished. All I was left with were empty Polaroids that I guess were meant to capture this moment. But this photograph exists though. This is probably one of the most well-known wartime photographs made during the Bosnian War. In the spring of 1994, Sarajevo was entering the third year of one of the longest sieges in modern history. Melina Galashanovic was headed to work in the neighborhood of Dobrinja. And this was a particularly memorable morning for her. It was namely the very first time that she walked out with her new short haircut which was a lot easier to maintain amidst the water shortages of the siege. On her daily commute to work, Molina had to pass this tree, whose once fancy boutique windows were now barricaded with sandbags. She also had to pass two snipers in the machine gun nest. So most people back then did not walk, they ran. As a civilian, though young knew that the moment she stepped outside, she became a visible target for the sniperists that had besieged the city. But in her own words, she had no other choice. An attitude was her only weapon of defense. When a sniper opened fire, photographer Tom Stoddard hid behind some of the sandbags. When he looked up, he saw Melina walking by confidently in a beautiful dress, high heels, and a matching handbag, completely unfazed by the actual sniper fire. That moment, he made this photograph, after which Melina simply continued to walk. The flowers on Melina's dress were blue, dark blue. Fast forward a couple of years. This is the fashion model of 2016. This is not a work of art, so my next slide is for a bit more collected and consultant for fashion house by Ms. Yaga, where Yamina Fusalia was at that time creative director. Here she's wondering in the dress. Flowers on Lotte's dress were blue, icy, blue. But let us come back to Melina and start zooming out on the situation. Melina was trapped in a conflict of moment aggressivity, one premised on crumbling former nationhoods and unwinnable new statements, in which inequality found perfect conditions to soar. The Bosnian conflict in which Melina's story played itself out became somewhat of a template for many future unsolvable conflicts of this kind, from Kosovo to Abkhazia to Eastern Ukraine, all conflicts that are characterized by a never-ending struggle for recognition, a massive identity politics, 
and paralytic transition processes that benefited both nationalists and oligarchs. But most of all, it benefited nationalist oligarchs. Let's jump back to Lotta, but start zooming out of this situation. Lotta was trapped in a conflict of enormous complexity, one premised on crumbling formulation goods and unwinnable new status in which attitude became an potent of currency. In the 90s, free market ideology and the collapse of state socialism reconfigured the map. But today, many nations have moved beyond this point. Deep globalization, authoritarianism, isolationism, ethnic degradation moved beyond the templates tried and tested throughout the 90s in Eastern Europe. Saakashvili is a man of change. He changed constantly and on demand. He has an ability to quickly transition into a huge variety of different states. Like many fellow politicians, he can cry on command. He can be naked if it's needed. Or when duty calls, he will wear Balenciaga here. And here again. And again. Or oh, that might be a toilet salesman. It seems that he is systematically wears Balenciaga for a purpose. Never really in the public, but obviously always posing in front of cameras. So later on, the image can travel from one screen to another. But most of all, he loves by the sneakers. Number eight, moving on. Big shoes, everybody. Another meme that I felt for. I mean, who would possibly buy big shoes? Why would anyone fall for this meme? <laughs> to make the worst shoe ever made that they still will probably buy. $800? Whoa! The others in nearby regions love Balenciaga too. Who are it better? To the left we have Serbian turbo folk queen Zetsa, and to the right it's Yelena Karlausha, the turbo pop folk icon in the by now iconic purple Balenciaga shoe pants. They used to be homegirls and all, but a massive feud between them started out in the nationalist 1990s in Serbia, when both of their partners were murdered. Seca's husband was the infamous Arka, head of the militia gang to serve volunteer guards, also known as Arkham's Tigers, who perfected the combination of privatization, blackmail, and genocide during the Bosnian War. He gets killed in the year 2000. Kalausha's young said being murdered in that same year by Arkham's gang. So she claims that Sensa was somehow the instigator of this whole scheme to have her indisposed from the scene. The conflict staggers on to this day with many tit for tat operations. Kalausha's father was mainly the chief investigator in the police operation that brought about the overthrow of Arkham's gang. He's the one who got Sensa arrested, detained, and accused of several crimes in 2003 including the illegal possession of firearms. Both are mashings of the so-called Turbo Folk genre. Turbo Folk is a wicked mashup of synth beats and traditional folk elements on steroids. It is the reflection of society in deep crisis, which started out at the wake of socialist Yugoslavia's collapse as a celebration of freelance pimps, high-ranking gang officials, and supreme surging nationalism before it got completely normalized. The result today, as one can see, is a botched reality of fractured faces, hiding under many failed surgical interventions, cover-up rogue operations, and plundering privatization schemes that are becoming a trend worldwide. Two Balenciaga outfits are fine. Three are even better. For any trend to take hold in fashion, you need the power of three, a consumer needs to see an item at least three times to make it into a trend. Once on a catwalk, once in some form of editorial spread, and then thirdly in a store packaged as a product. This is how even the most unpalatable or questionable of items ultimately gets normalized. According to Wiley, the Trump election team followed this path. 
They talk about, for example, inauthentic coordinated behavior or, or influence serve analysis or influence attribution. Well, my favorite, the target profiles observed acting in concert. Ooh, scary. It's a trend. We were looking at trends. We were working with the military to try to figure out how to examine trends. That's it. That's what we were doing. Using the data hijacked from Facebook users, Trump was presented again and again in various versions and in tailor-made targeted ads. And once Trump trended, his PR machine just kept banging on and on. Like on that Mr. Bones, right? Because as you may remember, this right is a circular right. It doesn't go anywhere and also never stops. Many things don't add up on this right because that right is not wide, it's slow, deliberate and circular and passed by many skeletons. In the same way, the former socialist countries are seen to be caught in a never-ending game of catch-up, catch-up for democracy. A common trope is that post-89, those countries don't manage to catch up to the Western democracy and that they are lagging behind. But if they travel in a circle, they might as well be ahead. Ahead in terms of privatization. Ahead in terms of the rule of oligocratocracy, in which feuds turn into feudalism, in which feudalism takes hold of Instagram, or Instagram takes hold of feudalism. And fame is weaponized by dynasties battling over influence within fame wars. To understand how privatization works, let's think back to the riddle in the beginning. We have 100 meters worth of raw material. So how do you fence in the largest area? By the way, this is a classical optimization problem. The solution is very simple. First, you build a circular fence with the fencing material, and then you just claim whatever is outside of that area as the new interior. This is how you claim the biggest surface area with a relatively small fence. And this is also the principle of post-89 privatization. Whatever was outside the former walls was claimed and privatized for a small elite. In 2003, Akashuri supported Rose Revolution, then Orange Revolution. The Rose Revolution in Georgia brought him to power. But he got prosecuted for corruption. He fled to Ukraine and became a provincial governor. But then he got in fight with a president whom he accused of corruption. And then he got prosecuted for corruption again. This is why he is on the roof. When Misha was in power, inequality reached its peak in Georgia, and workers' rights were depleted. In the factories of Batumi, workers earned less than six euros a day, regardless if it was real or fake Balenciaga items they were producing. But the rock style is not just your local trend. It is now becoming popular among the global oligocracy. In 2016, Yarna Karancha shot to international fame by accusing Kim Kardashian of appropriating her style. To the left, we have Kalasha, and to the right, it's Kim K. The headlines at the time read, Kim Kardashian has a famous Serbian doppelganger, and she's accusing Kim of stealing her look. Thanks to this international exposure, Yelena now counts as the fashion trendsetter, enjoying over 2 million Instagram followers. She's most frequently seen flaunting her Balenciaga and Kanye West's Yeezy footwear. Is this copycat logic maybe how that mom might have gotten into the White House? 
Actually, no. It is way more complicated or simple, depending on how you look at it. When Croc entered high fashion in 2016, it was immediately christened the ugliest shoe ever. But when Balenciaga premiered its own version in 2017, the shoe had gotten even uglier. It quickly became normalized, though, and other versions proliferated. It was sort of jammed into the overton window of the fashion industry. This dynamics of shock and subsequent normalization was what Trump's campaign backed upon. And we talked about the difference between Crocs on one hand and Chanel with a black dress on the other. And all of the variables that get put into making one quick and fast and regrettable and another enduring and iconic by how you craft your brands, how you craft your imagery, how you craft your clothes, how you show your values, because we depend on you guys, frankly, not only to make our culture, but also to protect our culture. We are in a cultural war. You guys have created the battlefield. And it is up to you if Trump or if Brexit, or if the alt-right either become Crocs or become Chanel of our political hate. All the clothes we dream of wearing end up on our bodies as a humanitarian second hand items. They were really our feet. The clothes were lousy and mostly oversized. They got even larger as they have been worn by multiple bodies, passed on from older brother to the younger sister, and later kept and inherited by the newborn cousin. In this way, poverty was constantly being passed on from the past, adding your brand to another brand, branding the unbrandable. We call this Balenciaga method not because it has anything to do with Balenciaga, but because it slaps the brand on top of pretty much anything. My generation, born in 89, got to know the world not through walls, but with transparent screens. It's a generation that understands usership but has problems with meaning. A vast so called free generation of the free market economy, we grew up with some freedom of movement, freedom of expression, and no future. But in Sala and Mom, you're not only for the global elite, but to this post-89 generation in specific, because they craft their brand on mean-based strategies. They test on principles of framing and reframing, thereby co-opting their consumers in creating habits. Whereas most luxury brands would rely on a certain aura of exclusivity to sell their products, Balenciaga twists this principle with a dose of irony, breaking from the image of snooty wealth and lending it an air of broader relatability instead. Their biggest hit, the IKEA Fakta bag. Number one! Balenciaga IKEA bag. That's right, everybody. I am designer Balenciaga. They call it the Arena Extra Large Shopping Tote. It's going viral because do you notice that it looks something similar to maybe the IKEA? Frakta. Oh, Frakta. It's Frakta. Stop stealing our culture. How many meatballs can I fit in that bad boy? Hmm? You can get the Balenciaga designer bag for two thousand one hundred and forty-five. <laughs> Price of 99 cents for IKEA's Fructa. And best of all, no assembly required on that particular oh, idea. Oh, I you know, oh, yeah. I mean, I'm fine. Mean, I... Husserl once described the carry bag as an extremely important tool for civilization and technology. She wrote that storytelling is more like a bag of foraging than a sphere for hunting 
And the bags are extremely useful because one can use one's hands to do something else. But if you look at the Balenciaga care bag, it turns out that it's even more useful than you think. Remember the fence optimization riddle in which all the outside was appropriated and privatized. Now, I think the Balenciaga IKEA bag does something very similar. But instead of reversing in and outside with a fence, it's like the bag that gets reversed and gets turned inside out, with the result that basically all the outside now gets branded, appropriated, and privatized. In a similar vein, the Balenciaga method can also be seen as an inverted form, in which the original content fades away and everything outside of the frame is done gradually. How might that work? It's very simple. Whatever is outside of the frame is claimed as private property. First of all, this includes the labor of image making, of uploading, of sharing, but also all the other frame activities and user preferences that are tracked accumulated, harvested, and mined. Basically, anything that is meant to be visible when you take a picture is blacked out of this process. The rest is backed upon and put on the block, or sold directly back to you via tailored ads and recognized algorithms. So carrying a phone and taking pictures today implies not just capturing the moment, as may be the case with a Polaroid, but also your data being captured, stored, and privatized. Pictures become frames or containers for invisible trails of information, and they are the source material for rampant commodification. Now, these frames are presented as social interactions on platforms like Instagram, but in fact, they end up being templates for self branding. Templates for a permanent missing art and the lagging behind to turn snapshots into brands, friends into followers, stars into royalty, but also they turn its users into unpaid workers. How come Balenciaga items overcome the law of gravity and trickle down into the bodies of 1%? When people who bought those clothes before keep trickling down, it has nothing to do with Balenciaga as a fashion brand that dressed bodies, but Balenciaga is an ultimate method of privatization to separate bodies from clothes. More specifically, it separates clothes from the body by making them look hot. You just hit poverty up to a certain degree until it evaporates in a steady of the survival of the fittest, and then we just put away until it comes back to you. As we have already seen, Isha wears Balenciaga, and he does it for a reason. As intended, when he wears it, he feels confident and powerful, whatever job he does. He's the one who perfected and finished the process that started from 89. He brought privatization to the next level. And whoever stood on his way was found dead on top of the newspaper kiosk, or abused and filmed in a prison. Balenciaga method. Learn from the best. On the story. Post it first. Privatize poverty. If there is nothing left to privatize, privatize unprivatizable. Privatize Bernie Sanders. If workers are on strike. Balenciaga their uniform. And then Balenciaga the uniform of those workers that cannot strike. This is not about Balenciaga. This is about the 89 revolution as a circle. This is about privatization 
and how it turns itself inside out and keeps turning in circles, just like a retro trend from hell. In a Batman Spring Summer 90s collection includes a QR code that when scanned will send users to the Wikipedia page titled Ethnic Cleansing of Georgians in Abkhazia. But what happens if we would apply the same scanning principle on one of the fake items? Where would that send us? Would that scan send us to PewDiePie, who we have seen talking about Misha's Balenciaga sneakers? In August of this year, PewDiePie was the first ever to surpass 100 million subscribers on YouTube. But his set of supporters also included the New Zealand gunman who shot 49 people in Christchurch Mosque. Before he set out to do this, he urged his viewers to subscribe to PewDiePie. Since then, it's become clear that the function of memes has shifted in the words of PewDiePie himself, it was fun until it was not fun anymore. This crash of meme logic may be or may not be one of the reasons why Temlak Vasalia recently stopped his involvement with Batman. He was quoted as saying, I have accomplished my mission. Oh, sorry. I have accomplished my mission. Batman was like a DARPA of fashion, a lab to test fashion politics and to play test as though the apocalypse skin had aesthetics. Balenciaga, in turn, is more like a corporate aircraft carrier. And that Balenciaga show goes on. So where is in and where is outside in this blue space? Are we inside of the bag and is the bag turned inside out? Or are we outside of the bag on its outside? For the most recent summer 2020 collection, Balenciaga remodeled the film studio in Paris to resemble the European Parliament in Strasbourg. But the setup in which this spectacle took place bears another striking resemblance, namely to Dante's Inferno. As depicted here on the 15th century woodcuts by Antonio Manetti, you can see that it is most akin to scene number one, everything reduced to one plan. And again, this is not about Balenciaga. This is about what it models. How does one create such a stage? We have made a model for you, Emma. So, this is basically a model of the stage. Basically, what you do is you take an IKEA bag, you cut it open, and then you twist it and you glue it back together as some kind of Möbius band. Now, what is the advantage of having a Möbius band? Because if you have a Möbius band, the inside and the outside actually are on the same plane, which means that there is no more difference between the outside and also that you're free to privatize both. The illusion that everything will take place on one single plane only arises if you watch it from above. If you see it from up there, there's hardly any difference between top and bottom. But if you see the same situation from eye level, it can look Exactly like the set you see here, jagged by massive cuts and income inequality. If where you are sitting represents the price level of an IKEA bag, then the price level of a Balenciaga IKEA bag would come to hover around 1,125 meters above this building. And 
you would have to actually see it from space to even remotely create the illusion that both happen on the same plane. If you see them horizontally, though, it becomes very apparent that top and bottom diverge and that they have long ago ceased to be even on remotely similar planes. Let's show you how inequality is structured nowadays. This is the past. This is before 89. Uh, as you all know, this is the famous slogan, uh, proletarians of all countries unite of rotation from the famous Communist Manifesto. Mm. After 89, this is what inequality looks like. And this slogan actually says, proletarians of all identities unite. This is a photo that Milos took in Sarajevo on the occasion of its first ever Pride March that happened earlier this year. And this was under threat by all sorts of violent religious nationalists. And the banner makes clear that even if in the meantime nations have become maybe not exchanged, but at least heavily supplemented by identities, one thing hasn't changed, namely that proletarians still exist. Identity is currently an opioid for the masses. It's a free handout for people who have little else. But like a lot of seemingly free stuff in digital economies, it comes with a lot of toxic strings attached above all the idea that you cannot change. Identities are a trap to keep people in their places and divide them. For example, as either Tim Kroc or Tim Shannon. Are you familiar with Kanye West? Sure. This is Kanye's sneaker, the last sneaker he released when he's still under contract with Nike. Well, you have blown my mind on the last two sneakers, so I hesitate. I'm going to go big on this one. Go big or go home, Bernie. Uh, that looks weird to say. A thousand dollars. What is the resale value of the Red October? A thousand dollars. A bit off road from the march that you've just seen in Sarajevo, I found this a balance siege sneaker for its many citizens that survived an actual siege on the run but cannot afford the brand product. Now, this shoe is clearly not a croc nor is it a Chanel. But what if it is not fake either? The Balancé sneaker may be what the proletarian pride protesters are wearing to confront religious and nationalist adversaries because they may be able to afford it. And not only that, but they quite frankly might not even give much of a damn whether it is fake or not. Because if identity is indeed a property for those who own nothing else, then this means that that same property can also be dismantled. Saya was a place literally besieged by identity. It is therefore not a coincidence that clues toward overcoming identity might originate in a country like Bosnia and Herzegovina, a country that has long since been debilitated, paralyzed and plundered to the max on the basis of ethno-nationalist segregationist politics. The power of three here has shifted into Bosnia's dysfunctional tripartite presidency, and the EU uses such border areas as storage zones where corrupt police robs and beats back unwanted refugees, leaving Bosnian municipalities like, for example, Bihać, to fend with the migrants' misery. The systematic militarization of security forces as a response to the current refugee and migration flow is ongoing. Rebellion against identity is underway in many other similar places, like Lebanon or Iraq. Just as here, people are realizing that divisive identities screwed them over and that the only way out is to change the rules of the game. This is not the only example of Balancish. Those are not fake. 
items. They are indications that proletarians are claiming back their shoes. This is how to distinguish a real Balenciaga from Balenciaga. As with every trend, we have to rely on the power of three to confirm it's real. Now, the Balenciaga never appears on a catwalk, nor expensive shopping windows, but they are validated as a real Balenciaga through three different ways of using them. This is the first step. The shoe has to be used in a protest within the United Nations General Assembly by being banged on the table, as modeled here by famous influential Nikita Kusho. Second step. The shoe proves its usefulness by being eatable. In the first case, one is to be able to eat the Balenciaga shoes. And demonstrated here by top model Werner Herzog who ate his shoes with onions. The second step. Balenciage need to defy gravity to travel towards the cosmos like a spaceship. As demonstrated here, Mr. Alzheimer attempted to shoot George Bush. Unfortunately, he missed it, so this specific shoe could not be confirmed as a real Balenciage sneakers. The nature of the shoe is defined by its overall value. When the exchange value of the shoe grows, its fight value automatically declines. It simply becomes too expensive to throw, or potentially even to wear. They are only useful for Instagram selfies. Balenciage are defined by their exquisite practical values. Balenciage might also be the symptom of countless sieges still taking place. Those no longer exclusively forged by national governments, fences or walls, but by corporate tech firms, firewalls, cloud computing systems, and fiber optic brand autocracies that valor visibility if it's in the benefit of monopolist platforms. Which might also explain why I never found those pictures of my father's wartime fashion show. Whereas they resorted to fashion because they felt invisible amidst a highly digitized war, today, we live an inverted principle in which endless online showcasings are governed by dot com corporate giants and transnational turbo capitalist regimes whose own mechanisms of conquest extend into the infosphere and are generally rendered invisible. Seen from today's perspective of relentless social media activity and brand propagation, my father's fashion show never happened. Those images don't exist because they're simply not profitable. Instead, this is what's going on. Let's have a look at the live comments from the stream we're just watching. This is Gucci Bot, seven, three, four, five, six, four minutes ago, and he yells, nationalize Balenciaga, using a lot of unicorn emojis, to which Hector boy replies, Balenciaga is bigger than any nation. And then this gives Team Gaskia Forever 71 the opportunity to chime in and suggest that perhaps Balenciaga could be nationalized to the Cayman Islands. The thing we didn't tell you is that we asked Christopher Wiley to program a bot trap to monitor paid PR and disinformation in real time on the stream and according to his exclusive analysis 45% of the fashion bots are here are Russian, 75% are Ukrainian, the overlap being caused by double agents, their lawyers, stylists and double trained makeup artists. The remaining 276% belong to different culture, cultural warfare departments. So we asked Wiley to design a back end bot trap to sequester them in some kind of bot inferno where they can design summer collections until the end of time. You are sitting right inside this bot trap. Specifically, they are being trapped under your butt. And here in this soft blue limbo, they can try to lure the alt right to their AI rendered jean styles or automate fashion by pulling user hashtags 
thus making designers superfluous. This was a bit of fake news, but very seriously, the idea of nationalization without the nation is actually very useful. What if not Balenciaga, but actually Van Siege, was actually an anticipation of an enterprise which actually belongs to the people who work for it, not only in material, but also in an image way. If a style is user co produced, user controlled, and even managed, Sure, now we're going to say, dream on, this is completely impossible and unthinkable and unlikely and anyway, it won't happen, but please look at this dude here. As you will certainly immediately recognize, this is Hoff standing on top of the burning wall. And actually, as you might know, there was a 0.0, .0 possibility of this ever happening. So now I think this is Chris Wiley. We asked him to. Hey, Chris. Oh, yes. Uh, well, uh, yeah, it's Hito speaking. Thank you so much for calling. Um, yeah, it's very generous uh, of you to say so. And I. Yeah, I totally agree your point. Uh, they are saying we look crap. We look complete crap. And they are offering to get you some sets of clothes. No, no, no. I, for me, I don't wear base caps. <laughs> Have you looked at my hair? This really doesn't work for me, but maybe, I mean, I can ask the guys if they want to have some sponsored clothes. I mean, you, you would have to know, negotiate with them directly because I, mean, I can't make this call, but I mean, are you going to pay them at all? Well, I, I don't think this is gonna work, but anyway, I will pass you on, then you can do those negotiations directly, okay? Wait, wait. When you the the same Mm -hmm. $11,000. Hello? Eleven. Hello? Eleven. Eleven thousand. No, no Thank you very much. I'm, I'm opening also for questions if anyone has. Uh, she can hear us. Yeah, she can hear us. Tito, can you hear us? Yeah. I hear you. I hear you. I do. Can you take some light out? Some light. So we can take some questions if there are any uh, at this time. And uh, yeah. even if you don't use the much you have there as well, you are welcome. Can you tell us more about the work? What would you like to know? Let's, let's I think then. the last Balenciaga collection was made of fakes or appropriation and fakes. What else do you want to know? <laughs> uh, when the work is shown, how is it shown? When it's installed? Uh, yeah, you yeah. saw part, parts of the installation. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this so, is part of the installation uh, exhibited and then documented. Uh, yeah, this was... Um, 
recorded and then it screens inside this installation which basically mimics the uh, Balenciaga catwalk Möbius strip architecture sort of. I'm not going to ask a question on asks for protection. Uh, I mean, we drive the, the, the discussion uh, always, but uh, I'm puzzled by uh, uh, referencing Bosnia quite often in your, uh, in your works, I think, and then the interest, and then recent interest also about Kosovo. And maybe if you can tell us more uh, why Bosnia and, and this. Uh, uh, comparison between Kosovo and other uh, uh, contagious territories, if, if you call them like that. And uh, I mean, unfortunately, this time over you couldn't come here, but uh, can you tell us more about that? Well, in this work, it's Miloš Mosti who's talking about Bosnia mm -hmm. and uh, trying also to uh, connected to this fashion show his father tried to organize during the war. So basically all of this is Milos's part and Milos's story. Um, Kosovo, I don't think it appears in the Balenciaga work, but it might. I mean, you, you have to tell me whether there is any point of connection. I don't know. But we are preparing a next lecture indeed, uh, which will deal with NFTs and uh, the politics of mining, but also scamming, <laughs> crypto scams, which are very creative and imaginative and uh, flourishing in many areas. Uh, Gago made a lot of research concerning Georgia um, which also has interesting characteristics in relation to the power grid. I mean, maybe the interesting thing with cryptocurrency is that there is a very clear connection between power and money. So basically power is money or money is electrical power. That's the first thing. But mining and scamming activities, which are sort of the condensed operations of crypto. Crypto in a nutshell is basically scamming and mining. They flourish in territories with unclear jurisdictions over power. So in Georgia, there is a shared power grid with Abkhazia, uh, which creates ample opportunities to basically uh, access electricity for free and uh, wreck the grid and so on and so on. So that's what we are exploring next um, to see how this connects to the art world's most recent infatuation with for so-called NFTs or crypto as a whole. I mean, just to give a context a bit, Kosovo, Kosovo's northern part a few, uh, um, I think a year or more, maybe also recently, it was in a similar situation. So power grid was controlled uh, uh, still by, by Serbia and, and only after an incident, which somehow touched the larger power grid in Europe, uh, the request for Kosovo to be cut from that power uh, network was accepted by the European Union. And then right now, that uh, space no longer exists, basically, because now the, the power grid in Northern Kosovo is diverted to the, to the network between, uh, constituted between Kosovo and Albania. So it's another power grid. But uh, uh, Yaudeta wants to make a question. Uh, and I'll, I'll give the floor. Hi, so since you uh, mentioned the NFTs and the cryptocurrencies, uh, we were talking today with Esther, and I really wanted to know her view of it. Yeah, mm, I had some problems hearing your question, but I guess it's about NFTs. What do I think yeah. about yeah. NFTs? Yeah. I just wanted to know your view on cryptocurrencies and NFTs and where do you stand? 
Well, you know, the pandemia created some kind of perfect storm, um, meaning um, a lot of people in the cultural sector in desperate need of money, plus a sort of concentration in the art sector, where basically, as in many other industries, the power shifted to the ones who had power anyway meaning blue chip galleries, auction houses, you know, all the usual old school um, corrupt art world players. And I think on the conjunction of this concentration of power, um, crypto fantasies and a big precariat through also pandemia, more widespread even than before, the NFT boom found a quite uh, productive atmosphere. Um, and you know, the, the interesting... How do you think it's gonna progress now? The actions? How do you think it's gonna progress, the NFTs? Are they gonna stay like this or? No, so right, right now, crypto is in some kind of lull, so the interest right now has diminished, but it will come back with a vengeance because I think the NFTs are more or less a gadget to create interest around a more large scale rollout of crypto infrastructure, which is already happening. So it's basically to get people used again through almost freebies to the idea that everyone needs a wallet, everyone needs to have currency. Um, and basically be introduced to Web3. So it will come back at some point, um, most probably. Yeah. Thank you. And the, yes, I, I see a question back there. Just let me add a, a tiny thing. So basically the rhetorics that's being deployed now around NFTs is a rhetorics that people who have you know, dealt with the internet for many years, have heard many, many times, it's going to democratize everything, the middlemen will be cut, it will be um, more open, access will be easier, and so on and so on. We have heard it on the, you know, early internet, uh, which then led to the creation of platforms like Google and Amazon. We have heard it with the creation of social media. And now we're hearing it sort of again, that this will uh, trigger a new period of democratization and um, equal, equal opportunities, which yeah. I think it moves. The, the first time it was maybe sad, the yeah. second time it was kind of funny, and now it's beyond funny. It moves back towards being quite sad, I think. Yeah, there was a question in the back. Uh, yeah, uh, hello. Uh, yeah. I have a question uh, because I feel like the research should be very ambitious and very complete. And I wanted to know if you have like a, a methodology, a way of doing the research, and in which way, uh, on what you, you gather, do you take liberty or not? Uh, and how does it uh, impact uh, the, the ideas of the script of the, of the video? I, I will answer the part of the question I was able to understand. Maybe, guys, you could help me and put it in the chat also uh, at the same time or a summary. So you were asking about the methodology of doing the research, correct? Yes, that's it. And how do you take liberty in, uh, in the information you do or not? Just uh, how, how do you... Uh, yeah, I mean, this was uh, written between the three of us on a Google Doc, very simply. And from the beginning, there were a few points which we knew we wanted to include, which were basically these switching points between fashion, uh, information, or surveillance, uh, algorithmic surveillance, and, and politics. And then we first accumulated some examples and the real uh, work was really in the editing 
of all of that to make it into something which seems coherent, even though you know there is a back a lot of back and forth between things which um, have only some degree of overlap. Let's put it like that. So the editing part is in a way most difficult. And I have, um, I've, I forgot to mention also, of course, a very important collaborator is Mick Madison, who wrote the music. I think that also is a very important uh, part of the work. It has basically uh, music written for it. All the Madonna covers and so on. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. I have a question, if I may, Peter. Can you hear me? Sure. Yeah, I can. Okay. So I'm interested about this. Uh, you say somewhere in the video, and it's a, it's a discussion, I guess, a larger discussion, how identities are replacing nations in a way uh, nowadays. And if you if you could go a bit further, uh, explain your position. Uh, concerning this latest, uh, uh, let's say, not, not to call it development, but latest phenomenon. Uh, in a way, and we see it also in, in, our, in our region more and more. Mm -hmm. Our identities, I mean, going back to uh, 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 going back to older identities than modernist states and nations. Uh, uh, is somehow played by uh, growing populism among us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, of course, identities are very complex phenomena. So what I'm going to say is a massive simplification. Um, but I think right now, uh, as I said, identity is sort of the opium of the masses. And it's imagined, interestingly, as a property. You know, it's something which can be owned. Uh, or which belongs to you. And mostly it's one of the only things which belongs to you. And people fight over it in the sense of a property, not as in the sense of a shared, you know, practice, which you, which can, has to belong to, you know, several people, but it's the most um, accessible form of private property. And that's what I find uh, quite irritating because it's very fragmenting and atomizing, you know, if everyone is fighting over their identity as their private property, it doesn't give a lot of sense of shared, of common ground, uh, nor, of course, of any sort of vision for solidarity or, you know, be, being able to negotiate your own point of view with those of others. And I think it has a lot to do with privatization uh, too. Uh, I think that many of, of the processes of transformation within Europe within this last 30 years um, were processes of the active production of identity, in many cases also through warfare. So warfare doesn't happen because of identity, but identity is a product of warfare. And that does, basically there has been a huge production in identities ongoing. That's my basic view on that. Thank you. Uh, if there are no more questions, I just want to thank you once again for doing this for us uh, tonight. and. Uh, Hope to see you soon in person here. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.